survival in the new normal is only possible for those who are disrupting the way they work. This has been clearly visible in the shift that Indian tech players have enabled towards work from home in order to maintain business continuity. Our next session on what the tech just happened is a panel discussion with India's best tech entrepreneurs. Our first speaker is Mr. Kamath, founder and CEO, Zerodha. Mr. Kamath bootstrapped and founded Zerodha in 2010 to overcome the hurdles he faced during his decade-long stint as a trader. He has been named one of the top 10 businessmen to watch out for in 2016 in India by the Economic Times for pioneering and scaling discount broking in India. Our next speaker is Mr. Kunal Shah, founder Cred. Mr. Shah also founded Free Charge, which was acquired by Snapdeal for an estimated $400 million. He's an active angel investor in a number of startups such as Innovate, Spinny, Zeppo, Unacademy, and Bharat Bazaar. Our third panelist uh, today is Mr. Abiraj Bhal, co-founder Urban Company. Mr. Bhal was with the Boston Consulting uh, Group, advising Fortune 500 companies across India, Germany, and Southeast Asia before he quit to begin the entrepreneurial journey with Urban Clap. The session will be moderated by Ms. Shaili Chopra, founder She The People TV and Golfing Indian. Ms. Chopra is an award-winning journalist whose work has been recognized in India and globally and has covered key events like Davos, G20, and 2012 American elections. Ms. Chopra is a Draper Hills Fellow from Stanford. She was an announced uh, 40 Under 40 by Impact Magazine for 2020. Over to you, Ms. Chopra. Thanks, Gauri and Archana. Really appreciate. Hope you've been having a great session. Uh, well, now that we've had introductions in place, uh, straight off to what's on everybody's mind. How is India making this a big opportunity, this pandemic at a time when everybody's moved to tech a lot faster than most expected them to, uh, and given an opportunity to a large number of tech players to notch up their audience and consumer basis. So let's start out with the big picture. Abiraj, I'll start with you. Uh, how has this pandemic thrown a brand new opportunity for India, and do you see it as an opportunity in the first place? Thank you very much, uh, Shaili and the Aston team for having me. Um, you know, I think every uh, every major uh, calamity or downturn like this one has many opportunities hidden within it. I think it was Winston Churchill who famously said, "Never, uh, you know, let uh, a, a tough moment uh, go to waste." And there's always an opportunity in such tough moments. Um, I think, um, particularly in this one, what many of us have realized is um, that trends and changes which were anyways going to happen and which were inevitable have only gotten accelerated. Um, so whether it's, uh, you know, the adoption of technology or the adoption of e-commerce, um, a whole bunch of other things, you know, which earlier, um, you know, behavior change was much slower to happen. Uh, and consumers would take their time. Now, that behavior change, which would have organically happened in four, five, six years, has gotten compressed in four, five, six months. Um, and I think, you know, businesses have one of two options. Either they can recognize that this is uh, the behavior change and much of it is going to last um, and adapt. Um, and part of that adaptation is um, you know, to become a technology first business, um, or like all such events, you know, they, they become, uh, you know, Darwin's way of ensuring that only the fittest survive. Um, overall, I'm, I'm bullish on India. I think, uh, you know, Indian businesses and Indian businessmen are very resilient and, and we as Indians are generally fairly resilient. So I'm quite, quite confident that even though the economy and the country has taken uh, you know, a shock, uh, we will be able to come out of this uh, stronger. Kunal Shah, are you going with the survival of fittest theory or the Indian resilience? Or are you going to find a vertex between those? Uh, I, I don't disagree with Abiraj. I think the thing that what crisis does is also it accelerates future. Uh, 
it does not just uh, become an and therefore it becomes an opportunity because when people are largely in a zone to change uh, and human behavior is the hardest thing to change at scale uh, when there is almost an inherent need to try new things people might remove the inertia to try new things there are there are so many people who are trying so many new things for the first time and and in one year we managed to get a lot of people to try almost uh, look at the uh, education ecosystem right right now we are having every kid is learning online uh, and i don't think anybody would have believed this is going to be possible and we've kind of accelerated that in many ways now there are some side effects to that and i don't know how to predict some of these things for example if every kid has learned how to learn online why should we have millions of teachers why should we not have the best physics teacher teach physics to every single child uh, and and make them better at it and and these are some very complex situations and and uh, many things will evolve from uh, here on uh, and and the 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 thing about uh, pandemic and 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 the thing is behavior change i i don't think we'll have the death toll that we thought we will have from this pandemic but i think the death toll on businesses across the world is going to be significantly high because people have shifted their behavior yeah so so actually let's take a cue from that the, the shift of the behavior has happened which essentially puts uh, tech in the driver's seat in a way that one hasn't seen uh nitin uh, how how op, sort of uh, are you optimistic are you about this tech piece um, and, and the sort of high learning curve that we've experienced in the last uh, eight months uh, continuing that uh, at the same clip uh, because it doesn't seem like there's a immediate uh, you know impending end to this pandemic so i'd like your thoughts on that and of course uh, your overall perspective on where we are today yeah um, no i mean like both abhiraj and kunal said uh, i think uh, like starting this year if you were to ask me you know so we are we, we are a stock broker right i mean uh, tech is is a layer on top of it right as in but uh, so we we are supposed to be like the barometer of how the economy does right uh, and if you were to ask me if you were to tell me in uh, in january and say nitin everyone's going to be working from home and the economy is is going to be where it is and and somehow in between all of this you're going to grow 200% i would have laughed about it right? as in as in it's uh, uh, i think all these predictions don't really play out you know i mean i could predict something and could be horribly wrong with it right now but uh, uh, what is what this pandemic has done though is whatever like growth like abhiraj was saying right as in whatever growth was expected over the next 3 4 years it happened in the in the last 6 7 months right and uh, uh, the funny thing for us as a business what we've seen is that as and when the pandemic is opening up and people are getting back to work uh, the number of uh, people opening accounts with us has is kind of tempering down right uh, so uh, which which potentially means that uh, this whole rush of uh, you know people wanting to invest in the stock market which is which is probably you know after edtech probably people want to invest in in stock market were probably two big outliers in this uh, pandemic right and uh, and and yeah as and when the economy is opening up and people are getting back to work the ferocity at which new people were coming opening accounts has has reduced as well right so uh, so so as a business just talking about uh, uh, you know what we do uh, i think as and when the economy opens up people you know probably the pace at which we added business will will probably drop right uh, but one of the learnings uh, over this last 6 7 months has been you know with regard to tech see most of what we built zeroda on is it's all built on top of cos it's all free and open source software and and one of, and that's been probably one of the only reasons why we were able to scale up so fast right and uh, and today a lot of people don't uh, try to build everything grounds up as a as a tech business uh, i i don't know if it's really a smart idea trying to build everything yourself because you know you end up building a lot of technical debt as well and uh, uh, so yeah so as a business the learning has been this here that uh you know this whole strategy of going force uh has has worked out really well for us so so when you did point out or rather confess that you know as economy opens and people get down to work uh, there's going to be a tempering in the kind of absorption of your product or service 
what does that tell you about the nature of consumers that joined you and what does that tell you about how you see the current future like oh, let's say the next eight ten months right yeah so the thing is uh, people wanting to invest in the stock market there were two or three enablers right as in uh, the first one was of course that markets had fallen so you know you you know sale is generally what attracts most people right as in everyone if there's a sale everyone wants to rush and get that, that product right so one is that uh, and now the markets have come back up so there isn't a sale anymore right uh, two is uh, the interest rates uh, in, in the banking ecosystem has dropped significantly right as in you you get five and a half percent on your fixed deposit so people are trying to make a little more than that uh, and and three is there were a lot of fence sitters who uh, like all my friends from school and college uh, most of them never had an account with us you know they all opened accounts in the last six months right because i think this whole work from home enabled people to think about thing other than their work right as in uh, you know so they were less busy and so which meant that they thought you know what i need to think about finances right uh, so yeah so if will will life when life gets back to normal uh, uh, what happens to businesses like say someone like us uh, there's a bigger problem in india that we are tackling right which is most of india doesn't have enough money to invest right so uh, right because we we you know our platforms can today be used by people who are, who make enough money to invest in the markets uh, and the economy is kind of uh, hurting that right as in uh, you know this whole lockdown is uh, as and when these things get back to normal uh, i mean i think i think you know it's 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 crazy that i'm saying this but uh, i think when things get back to normal our business will not do as well as it did when it was abnormal so. okay okay i'll take that i think definitely um, an honest admission there kunal looking at your business i have a two part question one is taking away from the way nitin puts it uh, do you also feel that there could be um, you know sort of a tempering of the rush but the second part is that really this entire pandemic has been uh, sort of favorable to those who've had connectivity those who've been able to turn the internet into an opportunity or to do something whether it's going to zerodha or taking any of your other services right so how is that piece going to sort of um, change the way things are um, because we don't see internet becoming overnight uh, you know that widespread in india with certainly that strength of connectivity yeah i think uh... it's funny but uh, all three of us are are mostly in the business of serving the top 20 25 million uh, households in india uh, and and uh, these customers were had the luxury of working from home uh, and and the privilege of working from home and and i think nitin made an interesting comment that they had more time and, and probably they were less busy because they probably were not commuting for 2 hours to the work and back uh, or Uh, otherwise have lesser meetings than they would have normally but the, the thing is that in certain categories like for example uh, categories that they need to do things versus there is an option for example do you need to invest probably not but you need to pay your bills you have to right so there is a, a difference between what uh, would kind of go back to normal and not go back to normal in in our category uh, it was anyway something people did we just have a better platform for them to do that and and we are able to see growth uh, uh, in this category because this was otherwise sort of a a fuzzy problem because otherwise the market was busy with the upi and mass market kind of a thing nobody really focused on the top 20 25 million customers now uh, what is going to be like normal and what is going to be regressing or whatever i, I can tell you one thing that if you look back uh, at human history uh, we have always adopted more efficient behavior and given up anything that was more inefficient right and if this is going to be the norm that we have operated with a uh, lot of the things that we have discovered to be more efficient is not likely to go back right uh, for example uh, let's say at urban company many people have figured out how to kind of get uh, uh, let's say a massage at home right uh, at fraction of a cost of getting it done outside and if this is a more efficient behavior for a lot of people it's likely to not go back to things uh, uh, normal things when kind of pandemic kind of uh, is is subsided in some ways at least in terms of fear so the thing is what will stay and what will not stay is is going to be interesting to see but uh, any existing desires that you had if it became more efficient during pandemic either because of the technology Uh, becoming efficient or you becoming more efficient on how to try some of these things is likely to not go back to normal 
uh, uh, let's take an example of video KYC as a norm in, in financial services. Uh, earlier, there were so many debates and so many discussions about, oh, should we have video KYC or not? Suddenly, every regulator has kind of made it normal to kind of do that. And honestly, uh, every fintech would have probably fought for years and not get this kind of result. Now, every day you get new changes coming to you and people are very keen to get this done. So. It, it, some things, I mean, will, will the government stop video KYC after the pandemic is over? I don't think so. Yeah, unlikely. I think that's a great example. And certainly, I think from a BFSI point of view, it's been transformational both for consumers and for banks uh, pushing while well, making COVID the transformation of a lot of reform at some level. Uh, Abhiraj, uh, where are you on what Nitin and Kunal said about consumer behavior and most importantly, um, the kind of efficiencies that kick in, maybe through the insights of urban company? I think what we are seeing, you know, is is a couple of things. So one, you know, when when the pandemic hit, much like what Nitin was saying, you know, we thought that that it would be a really tough time for us, and we thought it would, you know, be one one and a half years at least before uh, we would be in a position to uh, come back to our pre-pandemic levels. Because you know, what we offer our services like beauty, massage, haircuts, you know repairs and cleaning at home and this is a very high touch industry i mean you're welcoming somebody into your home right and that's the last thing that that you want to do in the pandemic it's the opposite of, of social distancing in some sense um but what we have been quite amazed to see uh, um, is that even though i think the overall consumption for these services has come down and and people are only using them on a need basis um, as a result of more share shift towards, uh, you know, our kind of platform, which is an online first platform, but also a safer, more organized platform. So if earlier you were thinking about saving that, you know, extra buck, uh, trying to get a local carpenter or a local cleaner now, uh, apart from the quality, you also have this added dimension of safety when you go through an organized player. What we're seeing is that the share shift has actually happened quite fast. So. You know, much of our sector is still recovering. Lots of businesses have shut down. Um, and we are now almost 40 to 50 percent higher than where we were before the pandemic, which you know, by no way would I have been able to predict. Um, so I think uh, you know, for us, it's, it's been that combination of uh, both the fact that there is a larger wave of, of moving online as well as moving towards organized services. Uh, now, how much of this will stick um, and how much of it will go back post the pandemic? The honest answer is I don't know. Um, and we'll have to wait and watch. Um, but I think somewhere what Kunal said, uh, you know, that, that if it's a behavior where the users feel that, look, it's, it's just a much better way of getting things done for much cheaper, um, either or, um, you know, uh, then it'll stick. And if it's, you know, if it's only relevant for now, and the original behavior is better, you know, um, like for now I can have all the, all the food eating at home that I want, but at some point I want to go back to a restaurant, you know, the restaurant yeah. industry will bounce back. Right. Um, you know, uh, we're having zoom offsites in urban company, but you know, it's, it's not even five or 10% of the experience of a physical offsite. So I, I do think some behaviors will go back. Okay, great. So I think a lot of the a lot of our audience here, of course, is in awe of the kind of businesses all of you have built and are trying to um, constantly re-gear for different situations, uh, such as the pandemic, uh, etc. So let's actually deep dive a little bit into what you think is going to be the startup scene going ahead. Uh, let's maybe start with Nitin there. Nitin, both in terms of talent and fundraising, uh, where are we going to be for startups uh, in the coming, uh, in the post pandemic world, or let's say pandemic world for the moment till we know it gets over? Right. No, I think, I think what's happening is uh, the big are getting bigger, right? And so I think the, the money is, is going to flow towards people who are doing well. I think, I think it'll be tough for uh, businesses, startups, which aren't really top-notch, you know, which aren't really top of the category, right? I think uh, 
uh, and and we're already seeing that right as in most of the money which is chasing right now it's um, uh, the big guys are just getting valued at, at a lot more than and then the number three number four number five so and and the number three number number four and below are finding it extremely tough to raise capital and i think that will continue to happen right and uh talent uh, uh i think one of the biggest challenges during this period for us has been new hiring right because uh you know it's 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 extremely tough to hire people remotely right as in uh, you know i mean especially for roles where you have to build some kind of trust with the person and uh, um so i think there is pent up demand uh, a lot of a lot of us companies which have done well during this period haven't been able to hire as much as we would have wanted to so i think uh, as and when things get back to normal uh, you know there this pent up demand like you know suddenly how uh you know this month has been the largest month ever for motorcycles sold in india right and and it's because there was pent up demand of 6 7 months right as in so i think there will be you know a rush of jobs uh or job opportunities available but again i think it'll be very in in survival of the fittest types you know in sense if if you're if you're top notch you'll get it you know otherwise i think i think we we're going to be very selective i'm sure it'll be the same with kunal and abraj as well but we we need to i think all of us need to go hire people to kind of uh you know uh, and and uh, like at least at zeroda we've been postponing the decision saying you know what let's get back to work and then uh, uh and then start hiring again you know so so kunal the efficiencies we all have been talking about actually have a flip side to the coin it just sounds really brutal that there going to be fewer jobs maybe or selective jobs or it's only filling certain kind of positions using tech it's beginning to sound a little um uh, i would say pessimistic for people who are wanting to make a beginning or hoping to go out there and say listen here's my idea help me raise money uh usually it did not need pandemic to tell us that efficiency reduces the number of job required uh we always did it force us though did it force us yeah i mean the the largest employer of the world has been in efficiency uh and and uh the moment you kind of uh, make the world force itself to become more efficient Uh, people are not going to quickly learn new skills for the new type of demand that is going to come and replace themselves uh, uh there was a time where uh, uh like maybe two generations ago you could have one skill one job and survive in that right uh, you are moving in a world where your skills are probably valuable for 5 years and you have to kind of quickly get into the new version of your skill uh, and and it's going to be harder and harder because the world is changing faster and faster right uh, we 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 still forget that uh, smartphones is not many many years ago uh, uh, the next thing is going to take even shorter period of time the innovation cycles have shrunk because the world has become like a superconductor which is connected to each other and things just spread uh, and and pandemic has spread because we are super connected in some ways ideas spread at a faster speed than that as well and we are going to have a situation where a lot of things now the thing is will the new jobs will have the new skills to match up to it and so on and so forth my my biggest worry for countries like india uh, and and many in our places like india is that the skill set the education system never kept up to kind of doing these things uh, the only people who tend up tend to have any income growth is people who can speak and communicate in english and and the rest of the folks are kind of kind of catching up to the income levels and my my worry remains is that if we're going to have this jolt of uh, not enough meaningful work there and the word is meaningful work uh, we can always create jobs like we've always had lift man and atm watchman like these are jobs that don't make sense but we've had them uh, the question is that how long can we sustain this because ultimately we will get uh, challenged uh, the the other worry i have is that now that the whole world has figured out how to work from home how will we retain our most brightest minds in this country because now you could be running a company in india while being settled in singapore so how are you going to kind of figure out a way to to retain talent over here uh, considering the infrastructure uh, uh, what, what is what kept us over here that we have to run a business we have to be here in person now that we have all learned how to manage business remotely why do we need to be in india and i think those are the things which will kind of create another second or second world second third order effects of these things yeah that's indeed to abhiraj on the tech front um 
has there been a lot of uh, rethinking, retinkering, thinking of how to sort of develop further the next big innovation? Or do you think it's been more of let's keep the ship steady on the tech front these few months? How do you see that play out? I think sort of how, you know, we think about it is if I was to just take a slightly more long term lens, like we think in order for us to even be relevant as a company in the future, say, you know, six, seven, eight years from now, like either we are, you know, truly technology company, which means that, you know, for any problem in the company, for any, any, you know, anything that needs to be solved in the company, we think not just sort of, you know, people or money or analog processes, but we also, you know, have a fourth dimension and a very important dimension, which is technology. And when I say technology, I mean code, right? Like code can solve many things which earlier were solved by people or were solved by, you know, some physical analog process. Either we are that company or, you know, we will get disrupted much like some of the companies we are disrupting today. Um, and this, you know, this is already happening, right? Like in the auto sector, Tesla has, you know, probably five, 6% of the global revenues, but it has more market cap than everybody else puts to put together. Right. And when Tesla is hiring today, like it's not hiring engineers from, you know, the internal combustion engine, uh, engine companies, it's hiring them from you know, Apple and, and Google. Right. So this is, this is the future. It's going to come. We can either be a part of it or we can resist it. And if we resist it, you know, we will, we will not survive. That, that is, that was clear to us earlier also. I think the pandemic has just made it like abundantly clear uh, that, you know, this is, this is it, right? And, and, and that, that means just the thinking more than anything else, right? People who are leading these companies need to be able to think first. Yeah, I think some good points made there. Uh, Nitin, uh, let's take this to um, what seems to have been for the longest time uh, a conversation very much alive, but I'd like to know whether talk of Internet of Things, use of AI, particularly in the business that you are, um, has that got enhanced? Uh, and how do you see some of that play out uh, you know, ahead? Have you been, for example, is your platform using a significant amount of um, AI currently? No, not really. I mean, we haven't really found use cases for AI as such. I mean, the only little AI that we use is uh, during our onboarding, uh, which is, you know, when we do this video KYC, we have to match the face to the proof, right? And we don't, that's not even built by us, you know, we use Amazon's uh, recognition for that, you know, so uh, that's the only real AI that we use. And, uh, uh, uh you know, the, the other bit of AI that we can potentially use is, is to kind of give people good stock tips, you know, in the sense, run some engine and, you know, figure out what's... I wonder what the regulator has to say on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but the, but, the, but the thing is, you know, what we have realized is um, you can give the greatest tips in the world, but, uh, you know, people are not going to follow it. <laughs> so, so there isn't any point giving advice when most people won't follow it. So... Uh, yeah, no, I mean, we, uh, as a business, uh, we haven't really found any use cases for, you know, all the fancy words, AI, blockchain, and all of that yet. You know? Yeah, that's right. That's true. I know sometimes AI just seems so simply embedded in email, but at the same time, we times we make such a big deal out of it. Having said that, Kunal, in, in again, uh, in, in the BFSI and, and the online experiments that are happening, including yours, which is uh, now uh, very, you know, at, at last read, what, 3 million plus, that's fantastic. So if you were to look at this uh how do you think this whole conversation that we've been talking about uh human centric service behavior connection that adoption to change um where are we on that you know we, we earlier just uh, alluded to the fact that uh, you know we're using ai for kyc for example but you know at the end of the day people do sometimes want to go back to that human touch uh, I, I have a slightly different view. Uh, according to me, humans have two types of transactions in their life, boring transactions and interesting transactions. Uh, and all human beings are trying to remove time taken from boring transactions. And they want to reinvest all that time in time taken in interesting transactions, right? I don't know anybody who has ever enjoyed filling fuel in their car. 
right? So just by making it human centric, you're not going to make that experience a lot better. I would ideally say if cars were auto fueled or on its own or ran on electricity or solar, and you don't need to ever fuel your car, you're probably better off, right? Uh, and and uh, and therefore the opposite also true. For example, uh, uh, let's say planning weddings for a lot of people is a big human experience. Uh, and no platform has ever worked over here, which says one click, you can get a Mendy vendor. Nobody is interested in that. People want to suffer. Uh, and, and go through that experience. So uh, I think we tend to overcomplicate these uh, buzzwords into businesses that fundamentally don't think. And I think uh, true for blockchain and AI as well. Uh, the thing is uh, very simple. People want some things to become more efficient and take time, remove time taken for that and make some things be more inefficient, more joyful, uh, uh, more pleasurable by suffering. Uh, uh, like Nitin, I'm sure um, probably cooks great meals. I don't think he's wanting efficient ways to uh, make a nice barbecue over here. <laughs> Surely not, I'm guessing. Uh, well, Abraj, okay, we'll just um, look at one more aspect of which, which is again, uh, like I was talking about this whole AI, IoT, but did you have to look at something like, uh, you know, IoT, for example, in a user experience point of view? Um, <clears throat> I mean, we've explored it in one or two areas. Uh, for example, you know, now in appliances, you have some of these IoT devices, which can tell you like, you know, if your RO filter needs to be changed or, you know, if your air conditioner is consuming too much electricity. Uh, but what we've realized is that uh, it's still not the point where, you know, it's so frictionless an experience to deploy and use that it's, uh, that it's ready for mass consumption. You know, much of, at least on the consumer side, IoT, home automation also, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge wave around home automation, but it, it still is in the, you know, nice to have playful, uh, you know, niche zone for people who want to, you know, dabble with it and figure it out. So we've thought about it internally um, and we've looked at it, uh, but we haven't been able to get our heads around, you know, how can this be something that can be mass relevant and, and very you know, easy to use for a lot of people, very frictionless. Okay, great. So questions have begun to come in and uh, let's take the first question, which I think some of us have uh, discussed, but I think it might be still worth uh, taking a shot at it. Uh, is it possible that we could find ourselves in a tech bubble because of the pandemic? Uh, maybe we'll take some quick answers. Nitin, I'll come to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, all, all, all these panel discussions <laughs> where we're all saying, you know, be tech first, be tech first, uh, is kind of pushing people who don't, <laughs> uh, who maybe also don't understand tech also to give a shot at tech. You know, I can, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you in the broking industry, there are 400 stockbrokers in India, retail stockbrokers, and 370 of them have run it the traditional way because stockbroking in India is a, you know, is a 100, 150 year old industry, right? And, um, and they all have suddenly woken up and they all want to be tech first right and i mean and and they're going to vendors and etc so i think I, potentially there can be like this bubble where everyone's trying to do tech and they don't do it well and it bursts i mean tech bubble on the on the on the stock market side i mean you can question and and ask if is a, you know we're probably already in the bubble if you want to look at market caps and etc right as in uh, that's probably happening already with the really large tech companies uh, it's 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 highly valued already as of now so. Okay, great. So let's take the next question with Kunal. For traditional companies, how can they build IT infrastructure and architecture that can adapt to a fast moving environment? It's like asking you to do a dissertation in exactly two minutes, but please do help. Uh, I, I have a belief that the, if your company is still calling it IT, it's probably not going to make it. Uh, I'm just being uh, aggressively uh, making a point, but I think, uh, the, the, the level of sophistication re required to compete in the world that we are entering in now. Uh, uh, we, we need tech guys to lead businesses versus business guys to, to try to figure out how tech works. Okay, Abhiraj, a quick one from you there. On this question, uh, yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I think, um, you know, try to accelerate and, um, you know, hire that's that's one way to think about it you know if you don't have the capabilities internally hire 
um and i would say respect like i think you know somewhere in in uh, you know as as the business folks need to you know start truly respecting the skill sets that engineers software engineers bring to the table i think that uh, for the mass industry still uh, still seen as an it department as kunal was saying so i think that that needs to change um yeah yeah sure yeah just uh, i just had one yeah. one bit yeah, yeah. so no because i've told all the tech folks in in our office saying whenever i get an opportunity to promote foss i will do <laughs> do it so i think i think people should look at foss uh, you know free and open source software because uh, you know uh, i don't think you know you can really build every single piece and uh, you know if you're building your business on top of uh, open source software uh, uh, you know good components etc i think you will get the technical updates you know whenever that gets updated the software gets updated so, so. <laughs> okay great that was an interesting input and i think as you yourself said that you built um you know zero dha based on that so one of the questions that i think is not new but comes pretty often which is that in india uh, why are we so reactive when it comes to technology and not proactive and i think this question was probably sort of uh, you know in the vicinity back 15 years ago when i was um, reporting for cnbc and they would say when will india get its iphone equivalent or something to that effect somehow that question hasn't changed for anyone here we still say india remains reactive as as india's foremost startup heads do you believe that's still true let's start with you kunal and we'll go around the room uh first of all we uh we we, we need to understand that it's not tech it's talent uh if the best of the talent is going to be somewhere else uh, that's where the innovation will be there uh, uh, the question is that what are we doing to ensure that the talent stays concentrated over here uh, if you look at the data you will find out that 10000 plus dollar millionaires left left the country in the last few years right so the question is that uh, are we doing enough to retain talent and i think uh, all the innovation is likely to come from nations which will create concentration of talent it be it, it's true for companies it's true for countries okay abhiraj do you agree with that or you have a different perspective on it look i think to start with i must say that we are not like in my view we are not uh, very behind right if you if you rank order let's say countries in in terms of their technology prowess or you know how vibrant the technology and startup ecosystem is you know we would rank in the single digits so i think um it's important to recognize where we already are um i think we have to have like a large domestic market right at the end of the day for any like for the next iphone to come from india or the next you know microsoft like software solution to come from india you know we can serve the world but you also need a very large domestic captive market right that's that's the reason why china grew and china's technology sector grew even though china is you know one fifth of the us in terms of gdp per capita but the sheer size of the domestic market today is 11 trillion and you know we are at 2.7 2.8 you know we're still a pittance right so i think that has to become like you know 7 8 trillion if not 10 trillion over the next you know decade decade and a half uh, and telling you that we are headed that way is there anything telling you that we are going that way there are positives i think um in the pandemic we have seen one wave of uh, you know in many sectors uh, the government uh, you know deregulating and and making ease of doing business uh, more straightforward um it's a start there's a lot more that needs to be done um you know to make the sort of regulatory cholesterol that still exists in the country and that's the only thing you really need to do right you need to make a level playing field and make it very easy to start fail build businesses um and then you know over time things will fall, start falling into place but we have a great benefit of having a very young population even today right so um so i think it will take time but um the the your the key answer to your question which is why hasn't it already happened and what will make it happen i think it will only happen if we have a large domestic market kunal you want to add i sorry i i wanted to just make a quick point when we compare ourselves to china one important factor that gets missed out is what happened with bangladesh the last 7 8 years 
they manage to overtake on per capita income and domestic consumption has a direct correlation to per capita income growth india's female participation of labor for urban india has dropped to under 9% which is at 68% for bangladesh and 93% for china yeah. right uh, and we are expecting this country to kind of grow on the per capita income when gen one gender is completely missing right now from the workforce and it's not it doesn't seem to be appearing in anybody's agenda or any discussion whatsoever uh, and i think this is a big thing that is going to keep our country behind there is not a single country that has managed to break out from more than 3000 dollars per capita income with more than less than 30% in uh, women working so and, and it doesn't seem to appear in any conversations and i think we talk about we've got upi we've got geo we've got data we have no money <laughs> Uh, uh, so uh, we need per capita income to grow, and there are fundamentals on how it grows. So I obviously completely agree with you. These are the exact conversations we do. We just need you guys to log on to see the people a little more often, and I'm going to make sure I have us coming to you as well. Uh, but without sort of taking away from that very critical point, I think there is um, there is a piece of this that I'm curious to sort of add to uh, through Nitin and then Kunal and back to you, Abhiraj, which is that. we keep talking about this young population we keep talking about how we are also somewhere in the reckoning when it comes to the world even though we don't have the iphone or some equivalent product to showcase but the question then is are we riding that on the fundraising the noise factor of our startup world or or the you know or the the capitalization of our large companies or are we talking about some fundamental tech breakthroughs here maybe nitin and kunal and then abhiraj on that right yeah so see the thing is you know when uh, i you you know now i use uh, all the three products right as in i, I use cred i use urban company and i use zero that right and uh, and i think you know our products are, are aren't i mean i think we are top notch as in like i uh, when i look at my competing uh, uh, product in the us uh, I, i think you know um, like i i i might have a conflict of interest in saying this but i think uh, Uh, as a product we are better and and today as a business we are doing some things that brokers in the us haven't done you know so in the sense in terms of tech as in uh, just to give an example we do 7 million trades a day we are doing more trades than the largest us broker right and and we are we are doing it by being faster than the largest us broker as well right so that that is some kind of a breakthrough in tech you know so it is i think i think there is see the the I think one of the good things that has happened over the last ten years with this whole uh, the VC boom has been that there is talent in this country, right? As in, it isn't it isn't missing. As in, there is there's really good talent in this country uh, uh, because uh, all the money that has come through that VC boom has has uh, you know has uh, helped build that talent. Uh, the the issue though, like Kunal said, is is uh, as a country, how do we go now, right? As in, uh, and and that's a big problem to solve. uh i don't know who's really got the answer for that but uh, but i think the you know hopefully government does stuff uh, and and you know uh, once we grow as a country i think there's enough talent around here to uh, you know kind of leverage on tech and and things okay so is abhiraj for example part of the problem uh, the fact that most solutions at this point are targeted at the top whatever 20 million uh, consumer base is that one reason why we have still not let's say got the so called gap between india and bharat out there uh, as a priority and every time the slow down happens does that even worsen you know the opportunity for that to change worsen yeah i mean look i you know i'll say something that is probably not politically right but see at the end of the day the purpose of a business is to make money right it's not to be like a fairy godmother you know to do uh, you know to, to do you know uh, good for people and in india the the income you know divide it's after the first 20 25 million households it was basically like you know you need something called disposable income right to spend beyond just basics of you know food clothing shelter disposable income is very thin so to build viable profitable businesses um it's not impossible i mean there's many who've done it uh but you will have um, uh, you know most businesses focus on 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 you know the 10% that is uh, or or it's actually less than 10% of the 5 to 7% of the households that are um, 
you know, profitable to serve. Uh, and, and that's just the simple truth. So we need more and more and more households to start making more than seven, eight, ten lakh rupees per annum. Today, that number is about 25 to 30 million. The day that number becomes 100 million, you know, you will have many, many more larger and profitable businesses. I think, and the question is the day and when that day really comes, right? I think, uh, as you said, politically correct or not, we must raise some tough questions. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to take some closing comments, uh, which would mean that we will put you on... Uh, on the seat of a general stock market broker who's expected to make some predictions. <laughs> so here you are with the question that's come in. Please take a moonshot on what we should expect in the next 12 months. Um, I would say, to be fair, just take it in your own industry. So at least it's a calculated guess. Kunal, I'll start with you. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a prediction. That I can just say that uh, we are all in the same place as individuals and as businesses to upskill uh, and, and the only way we'll survive this game uh, uh, is to completely transform uh, uh, the way we operate and the way we think. Because uh, 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 like I said, a crisis has accelerated future. Uh, do you belong there or not is going to be how you upskill for the game. Okay, upskill for the game, Nitin. No, I, I am a stockbroker. So, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I, I think I, your prediction could be really <laughs> dodgy, huh? Okay, try, try that. Yeah, yeah no, uh, uh, no, I think, I think uh, uh, they're talking about savings, investing and all of that. I think uh, um, we are somewhere, like at least personally, I think, I don't know if I should be saying this as a broker, but I think we are in a bubble for sure. And because I don't think there's ever been this much uh, non-correlation between the underlying economy and the stock markets. Uh, so, uh, so I think it'll correct. If it corrects, uh, I think the activity is going to drop significantly for uh, for businesses building stuff around savings and investing. And yeah, I mean that's what I'm thinking in the next one two years. I think uh, it it is. I think we've already seen the peak. I think it's going to trend down. Okay, now to the person who said he's pretty bullish after listening to what Nitin Kavat says. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I think I'll just make like a general observation, which is, um, I think in the last few weeks, the news around the vaccine has been very positive. And, and, you know, hopefully it's a matter of a few months before, you know, that vaccine is available for mass distribution. And India is actually quite, like, historically, we're quite good. This is a muscle that we have you know, distribution of vaccines. We, we conduct a general election every five years where we may, you know, create one touch point with 600 million Indians in a month, right? So um, I, I think, you know, businesses which can benefit, which today might be very suppressed and, you know, people might have a negative view on them, but which can bounce back post the vaccine. Like if I was an investor, I would think about putting money into them today. Because I think the you know we're still staying in a world where it's theoretical, like how consumer behavior in some sectors will bounce back. We're theoretically saying yes, it will post vaccine, but you know we've just seen so much fear that uh, yeah. that it's hard to see. So let's say let's say movie going for example, you know I would I, uh, I would I would you don't think you know, it's changed life? People go back? No, no, for no, for sure I don't think so. No. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, cool. So the question that I wanted to ask you right from the start, but I've kept it for the last is that what is the one thing you guys discovered about yourself in this pandemic? You know, we all had a little bit of time as one of you pointed out, uh, we had time to think. So, so maybe I'll start uh, with Kunal. What did, what, what did you do uh, outside of your startup? Outside of my startup, I, I, I guess uh, when crisis hits the the only thing you that start thinking about survival and, and making sure that your startup kind of thrives during this time. Uh, honestly, uh, I think the only thing I've done is probably uh, read more uh, and studied more on how to uh, survive uh, and, and thrive uh, and, and just applied all of that uh, at work. Uh, did not get a chance to do anything else, really. So you didn't do anything that surprised the Kunal Shah inside you? Not at all? Uh, Boring so person. I'm a boring person. I've probably grown a beard. That's what I've done. That is a surprise for Oh, <laughs> see, that's true. You're adding to that new survey on what's up with people and beards. Okay, great. Uh, Nitin, you? 
I heard barbecue, but it didn't come from you. So tell us. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I added eight kilos. Uh, I lost eight kilos. <laughs> so uh, I think the, um, I, I didn't realize that I can stupidly work for the, I mean, it's not even work. I think I can remain busy for so long in a day, right? As in, it's just, um, it's just quite crazy. I mean, eventually, I think one month back, I turned off all my notifications on my phone. I've been wanting to do it for like, I don't know how many years. Uh, eventually, I think this, uh, you know, the COVID kind of pushed, this whole work from home pushed me to do it. Uh, and uh, and I turn off all my devices by eight. Uh, and I've been wanting to do that as well. Because I think, but then, you know, that learning came after getting, you know, uh, you know really, really damaged of source this year. Uh, uh, being constantly being busy and distracted, you know. Good confessions there, Abhiraj. I would say my life has definitely become saner. And two parts to that. One is we had a, a baby girl um, Christmas last year. So, you know, I would just um, love spending time with her. And then, you know, by design, I think if I look at my average calendar uh, for a week now versus, let's say, a year back, um, it's 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 it has more white space. It is less packed, and I, I still feel like I am able to get much done. Um, sometimes when you're in office, you know, it's just things just you know your calendar gets packed. Um, you know, you can get very busy. So, yeah, I think in a weird way, I've I feel like I've become more efficient. Um, I have started going to the office one or two days of the week, and. When I contrast those with the days I'm working from home, actually, it's very visible to me that on those days that I'm going to office, I am definitely like less efficient. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, saner, I would say saner calendar. Okay, thanks very much, gentlemen. Wonderful chatting up with you.